Times the Brief. These are the top stories of the day. Why You Shouldn't Wait for Updated COVID-19 Boosters by Alice Park A new version of Omicron, BA5, is now responsible for more than half of new infections in the U.S. No one seems safe from being able to catch it, not even vaccinated people or those who have gotten COVID-19 in the past. That's because this virus is different enough from the original version and even from previous versions of Omicron that the vaccines and booster shots everyone has been getting are less effective against BA5. Plus, any immunity that people generate, whether after getting vaccinated or infected naturally, wanes after several months. Given the nation's diminished immunity and current BA5 surge, more people are wondering whether they should get a booster or second booster now, or if they should wait until the fall when a new shot will likely be available. Here's what to know. Who should get a booster? Currently, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommend one booster shot for everyone ages 5 and older who are five months out from their last COVID-19 vaccine dose and second booster doses for people ages 50 and older at least four months after their first booster. Additional boosters are recommended for people with weakened immune systems. Public health officials are considering expanding eligibility for a second booster to all adults, but both the FDA and CDC are still reviewing data before making a recommendation. Should people wait for the Omicron booster in the fall? On June 30th, the FDA decided that the next COVID-19 booster needs to target the Omicron subvariants BA4 and BA5 specifically, because such a booster would likely increase people's protection from getting infected with Omicron and hopefully extend that protection to longer than a few months. The data the FDA reviewed involved primarily BA1, an earlier subvariant of Omicron, so the agency asked vaccine makers to provide additional data on immunity produced by boosters targeting BA4 and BA5. But while it's tempting to wait until the updated booster is available, which will likely be around October, according to White House health experts, those same experts are urging people to get boosted now, given the rising number of cases due to BA5. The threat to you from BA5 is now, said Dr. Anthony Fauci, director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases and the White House's chief COVID-19 medical officer in a briefing on July 12th. If you are not vaccinated to the fullest, namely not gotten boosters according to the recommendations, you are putting yourself at increased risk. Getting boosted now does not preclude you from also getting an Omicron-specific booster in the fall, he added. If the risk is now, address the current risk. Fauci also noted that immunity from currently available boosters does wane and that boosted people can still get infected with BA5. But he stressed that studies show that vaccinated and boosted people tend not to get as seriously ill from COVID-19. Most tend to have milder disease and less severe symptoms. The same is true for protection generated by previous COVID-19 infections. The CDC recommends that people who have been infected with the virus continue to follow the same vaccination and boosting guidance. If you are previously infected and also vaccinated, you have much more protection from serious disease than prior infection alone, which leads us to recommend that you get vaccinated and stay up to date with boosters, said CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky during the briefing. What about a second booster? Even if people get a second booster this summer, they would still be eligible for the updated Omicron booster in the fall or winter, Given the current cadence of four- to six-month intervals between boosters, it's likely people might have to wait a similar amount of time before getting the updated booster, but the original booster formulation would continue to protect them against severe disease in the interim. That's why, for now, public health officials urge anyone age 50 years or older not to put off getting a second booster, since the shot will guard against hospitalizations and death from COVID-19, as well as offer some degree of protection against getting infected. 
if you get a booster now, it does reduce your risk of getting infected with BA5, said Dr. Ashish Jha, the White House COVID-19 response coordinator, during the briefing. It does not drive it to zero, but it reduces that risk, and the data are very clear that if you are over 50, that extra booster dramatically lowers the risk of getting into the hospital, going to the ICU, or dying. There are very few things we do in medicine that have the kind of benefit we see from that extra shot. Biden's Saudi Arabia trip is really about Russia, by Brian Bennett. On the campaign trail, President Biden talked tough on Saudi Arabia. He said the kingdom should be treated as a pariah after the murder of Saudi dissident and Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi. One of his first acts as president was to declassify the Office of the Director of National Intelligence's assessment that Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman approved Khashoggi's killing. That was then. As Biden travels through the Middle East for the first time as president, his campaign's emphasis on human rights has given way to real politic. The White House has concluded that the U.S. needs its old ally Saudi Arabia on its side as America leads the global effort to punish Moscow economically for its brutal war in Ukraine and prepares for a new era of confrontation with Russia. The Russian invasion of Ukraine gave this trip more of a great power competition focus, says Aaron David Miller, a former senior advisor for Middle East policy at the State Department. Biden will have to swallow his pride as he makes nice in the Middle East. When the 46th president visits Jeddah, after his swing through Israel and the West Bank, he'll be attending a meeting of Gulf states where he is expected to have face-to-face meetings with bin Salman, the de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia. That moment will highlight Biden's willingness to put U.S. strategic interests ahead of the kingdom's noxious human rights record. Even as sanctions begin to bite the Russian economy, the U.S. is seeing countries worldwide hedge their bets. Israel, for example, continues to maintain its open relations with Russia in hopes of managing security threats from Syria, where Russia has a military base, and tending to long-standing ties between Israelis and Russian Jews. Saudi Arabia, for its part, sees its relationship with oil-rich Russia as a way to help influence global energy markets on which the Saudi economy largely depends. Similar cross-cutting interests are playing out across the globe. Of the 10 most populated countries in the world, only one has bought in to a comprehensive package against Russia, and that's us, Miller says. That's why Biden's trip is part of a broader effort by the U.S. to shore up what wonks inside the West Wing call middle powers, those countries who could be lured to Russia's side as the conflict in Ukraine reheats the competition between Moscow and Washington. It is precisely because the world is becoming more geopolitically competitive that the U.S. needs to remain intensively engaged in the Middle East. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan told reporters before Biden left on his trip. One of Biden's objectives for his time in the region, Sullivan said, is to ensure that no foreign power can dominate or gain strategic advantage over the United States. The U.S. has the edge in much of the Mideast. The Saudi-Russia connection is nowhere near as deep as Riyadh's with the United States, which dates to the decades after the House of Saud seized power on the peninsula in the early 20th century. Moscow's relationship with Riyadh was tense following the Soviet Union's 1979 invasion of Afghanistan and the Saudi and U.S. effort to back Mujahideen fighters resisting the Russian occupation. Diplomatic relations between Russia and Saudi Arabia weren't reestablished until 1992. But the U.S. can't take Saudi Arabia for granted. Russia and Saudi Arabia took a step closer to each other in 2016, when Saudi leaders convinced Russia to join an expanded version of the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries known as OPEC+. That partnership has been one of convenience and was partially motivated by Saudi frustration at seeing the U.S. develop fracking and shale extraction technologies that boosted U.S. oil production. 
The Saudi-led group of oil producers agreed in June to increase oil sales, but production so far has lagged behind the targets. Any increase in oil production from the region will take months to have an impact on high U.S. gas prices, a major political liability for Biden going into the midterm elections. Over time, the Saudis apparently have come to see the U.S. as a less reliable partner, and that's created an opening for Russia, says Eugene Rumer, the director of the Russia and Eurasia program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and a former national intelligence officer for Russia and Eurasia at the U.S. National Intelligence Council. Russia and Saudi Arabia share a common aversion to the U.S. bringing up human rights as a major policy issue, Rumer says. Russian President Vladimir Putin is only happy to jump in where the United States seems to be leaving some vacuum, Rumer says. Putin doesn't have much to offer the Saudis in the long term. But for Putin, there's a sense of playing on the big stage again, Rumer says. For more than two decades, the U.S. has worked to integrate Russia into the global economy on the idea that Russia's interests would start to align more with American and European economic interests. But Putin has shown with his repeated invasions of Ukraine that he's unwilling to moderate his ambitions, and Russia's ties to the world economy have now become one of its strategic assets, as the U.S. and Europe experience how difficult it is to isolate Russia's $1.7 trillion economy without damaging the European and American economies. Saudi Arabia and the U.S. also both view Iran as a threat, a concern that may also argue against placing human rights at the top of the list of Washington's priorities with Riyadh. When you are leading the most powerful and significant country in the world, sometimes you have to meet with people and go to countries where they are a seriously problematic partner, says Bradley Bowman, a former army officer and an expert on U.S. military strategy with the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Bowman believes it would be negligent for Biden not to go to Saudi Arabia. The U.S. also has an eye on China's increasingly global ambitions. We know that Russia never left the Middle East, and we know that China's active there both diplomatically and economically, Bowman says. China's first overseas military base was established in Djibouti, near a U.S. military base in that country. If the U.S. is going to compete in this great power competition in the Middle East, Bowman says, it has to tend to its relationship with countries there. That doesn't mean we need to have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of troops there necessarily, Bowman says. But if the U.S. doesn't keep up some of its military relationships there, Chinese and Russians will be among those most happily waving goodbye as we depart the Middle East, Bowman says. President Biden would love to see OPEC in general, and Saudi Arabia in particular, producing more oil to try to get gas prices down. But if you're constantly criticizing Riyadh and you're constantly talking about how you want to leave the Middle East and pivot elsewhere, Bowman says, then when you come calling hat in hand with requests about pumping more oil or doing this or doing that, anyone who tries to maintain personal relationships understands that may not be well received. After Biden departs, Putin will be visiting the region next week. The Russian president is scheduled to meet in Tehran with the leaders of Iran and Turkey. The Biden administration is concerned that Iran is selling drones to Russia for use on the battlefield in Ukraine. Facebook accused of whitewashing long-awaited human rights report on India by Billy Perigo. Facebook's parent company, Meta, has been accused of whitewashing a long-awaited report on its human rights impact in India, which the company released in a highly summarized form on Thursday, drawing fire from civil society groups. Time first reported in August 2020 that Facebook had commissioned the Human Rights Impact Assessment, or HRIA, in an effort to determine its role in the spread of hate speech online. The report has been anticipated for nearly two years by rights groups who have long raised the alarm that Facebook is contributing to an erosion of civil liberties in India and to dangers faced by minorities. Anki Das, 
Facebook's most senior executive in India, resigned in October 2020 after the Wall Street Journal reported she had intervened to prevent the platform removing accounts of members of the country's Hindu nationalist ruling party, some of whom had called for violence against India's Muslim minority. India is Facebook's largest market by users. The India HRIA was carried out by an independent law firm, Foley Hoag, which interviewed more than 40 civil society stakeholders, activists, and journalists to complete the report. But Facebook drew criticism from rights groups on Thursday after it released its own four-page summary of the law firm's findings that was almost bereft of any meaningful details. Ratumbra Manuvi, an academic who was one of the civil society members interviewed by Foley Hoag for the report, said Facebook's summary was a cover-up of its acute fault lines in India and showed that its commitment to human rights is rather limited. The real Facebook Oversight Board, a pressure organization made up of critics of the platform, said in a statement that the report was a masterclass in spin and obfuscation and a whitewashing of the religious violence fomented in India across Meta's platforms. Facebook's summary of the report, the full version of which was not made public, says that Foley Hoag made recommendations to the company on how to improve its human rights impact in India. But Facebook's summary did not disclose what those recommendations were. The four-page summary says, The HRIA developed recommendations covering implementation and oversight, content moderation, and product interventions, and other areas. It then details in the following seven paragraphs the human rights measures that Facebook is already taking in India, including increasing its content moderation workforce and bolstering transparency. Facebook adds that the full report does not make any judgment on the most contentious allegations stemming from the DAS controversy in 2020, that its moderation of hateful content in India is biased toward the ruling party so as to maintain market access. The assessors, Foley Hoag, noted that civil society stakeholders raised several allegations of bias in content moderation, Facebook's summary of the report says. The assessors did not assess or reach conclusions about whether such bias existed. Facebook and Foley Hoag did not respond to requests for comment in time for publication. Facebook may as well have published a few blank pages on their human rights impact assessment on India. Alafia Zoyab, the director of campaigns and media for the progressive tech lobby group Luminate, said in a tweet, I've never read so much bullshit in four short pages. This is an insult to Indian civil society, Zoyab added. Manuvi, who is a legal scholar at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands, said that the foundation she runs, the London Story, had reported more than 600 pages that it says are hate accounts based in India to Facebook, but that the platform had only removed 16 of them. As stakeholders, we told Foley Hoag very clearly that Facebook has provided momentum for fringe groups to organize, hunt, and dox interfaith marriage couples, Manuvi told Time. Facebook's summary of the report contains no mention of this specific form of platform abuse. In 2021, Time reported that Facebook allowed a Hindu nationalist conspiracy theory to flourish on its platform, despite employees at Facebook warning of the risks. One video of an extremist preacher calling for Hindus to rise up and kill Muslims racked up 1.4 million views, but was not deleted until Time contacted Facebook about it last November. Earlier this year, Time reported that Facebook banned a Hindu extremist group under its terrorism policies, but left most of its pages online for months after that ban, allowing them to share content depicting Muslims as green monsters with long fingernails to their more than 2.7 million total followers. Ivana Trump Dies at 73 by Jill Colvin and Jennifer Peltz, Associated Press, New York. Ivana Trump, a skier turned businesswoman who formed half of a publicity power couple in the 1980s as the first wife of former President Donald Trump and mother of his oldest children, has died in New York City, her family announced Thursday. 
She was 73. I am very saddened to inform all of those that loved her, of which there are many, that Ivana Trump has passed away at her home in New York City, Trump posted on Truth Social. She was a wonderful, beautiful, and amazing woman who led a great and inspirational life. Her pride and joy were her three children, Donald Jr., Ivanka, and Eric. She was so proud of them, as we were all so proud of her. Rest in peace, Ivana. Their children also released a statement calling her an incredible woman, a force in business, a world-class athlete, a radiant beauty and caring mother and friend. Ivana Trump was a survivor. She fled from communism and embraced this country. The statement continued. She taught her children about grit and toughness, compassion and determination. She will be dearly missed by her mother, her three children and ten grandchildren. A Czech-born ski racer and sometime model, Ivana Trump married the future president in 1977. She became an icon in her own right, dripping with 80s style and elegance, complete with accent and her signature beehive hairdo. She would eventually appear in the 1996 hit film The First Wives Club with the now-famous line, Ladies, you have to be strong and independent, and remember, don't get mad, get everything. Partners in love and business with her playing roles, such as manager of one of his Atlantic City casinos, Ivana and Donald were fixtures of New York's C and B scene scene before their equally public and messy divorce. Donald Trump had met his next wife, Marla Maples. During the split, Ivana Trump accused him of rape in a sworn statement in the early 1990s. She later said that she didn't mean it literally but rather that she felt violated. Nevertheless, she ultimately remained friendly with her ex-husband, whom she famously called the Donald. She enthusiastically backed his 2016 White House run and told the New York Post in 2016 that she was both a supporter and an advisor. I suggest a few things, she told the newspaper. We speak before and after the appearances, and he asks me what I thought. She said she advised him to be more calm. But Donald cannot be calm, she added. He's very outspoken. He just says it as it is. However supportive, she occasionally ruffled feathers. In 2017, while promoting a book, she told Good Morning America that she spoke with the then-president about every two weeks and had his direct White House number, but didn't want to call too frequently because Melania is there and I don't want to cause any kind of jealousy or something like that because I'm basically first Trump wife, okay? She said with a laugh. I'm first lady, okay? Melania Trump's spokesperson at the time responded, saying there was clearly no substance to this statement from an ex. This is unfortunately only attention-seeking and self-serving noise. Ivana Trump was born Ivana Zelnikova in 1949 in the Czechoslovak city of Galtvatov, formerly Zlin, which had just been renamed by the communists who took over the country in 1948. She married Trump, her second husband, in 1977. The COVID-19 pandemic fuels the worst decline in childhood vaccinations in 30 years by Jinshan Hong, Bloomberg. Global childhood vaccination rates experienced the largest decline in about three decades amid COVID disruptions, putting growing numbers of children at risk from devastating but preventable diseases. The percentage of children who received three doses of the vaccine against diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, or DTP3, was set back to its lowest level since 2008, falling to 81% in 2021, according to official data published by the World Health Organization and United Nations Children's Fund on Friday. The decline means 25 million children missed out on at least one dose of DTP through routine services in 2021 alone, 2 million more than in 2020, and 6 million more than in 2019. This is a red alert for child health, said UNICEF Executive Director Catherine Russell. We are witnessing the largest sustained drop in childhood immunization in a generation. The consequences will be measured in lives. The backslide, along with declines in coverage for other basic vaccines, 
pushed the world off track to meet global immunization goals. The drop is in part due to the coronavirus pandemic that disrupted supply chains, diverted resources, and hindered immunization services and availability during lockdowns. An increased number of children living in conflict and fragile settings, as well as more misinformation, also played a role, officials said. Immunization catch-ups for the missing millions of children are urgently needed to avoid more outbreaks, more sick children, and greater pressure on already strained health systems, said Russell. Vaccine coverage dropped in every region, with the East Asia and Pacific region recording the steepest reversal in DTP3 coverage. Officials earlier estimated that 2021 would be a year of recovery for childhood vaccines after the initial COVID shock passed. Yet the sharp two-year decline further worsened almost a decade of stalled progress. Planning and tackling COVID-19 should also go hand-in-hand with vaccinating for other killer diseases, said WHO Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus. It's not a question of either-or. It's possible to do both. This has been Times The Brief. For more stories, visit time.com. Spoken Layer.